Greetings. I'm Glenn Alex, your host of The Glenn Alex Show, the 2023 Positive Change Podcast Award winner for health and wellness and finalist in psychology. And each episode of The Glenn Alex Show focuses on a different aspect of health because I believe in total health. You are whole and all of you matter. That's why I'm on a mission to help you be joyful, connected, confident, and complete. The life experience I call wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H, which is health plus other riches. And please keep in mind that physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually balanced people, people who are living into their wholeness, do not intentionally harm self or others. So as we work together to all live in total health, we can make humanity safe and loving for everyone. Please visit glennalex.com for more information on my work. And stay tuned for this impactful episode on hospital errors. Please help me welcome my guest, Dr. Shadi Vadat. Dr. Shadi Vadat brings a wealth of experience to the medical field, combining her internal medicine expertise with a strong foundation in integrative medicine. A graduate of the University of California, Berkeley and Albert Einstein College of Medicine, she has worked across a spectrum of healthcare environments, including nonprofit clinics, her private practice, and academic hospital settings. Dr. Vadat's dual role as a hospital physician and as a caregiver for her loved ones has afforded her a 360 degree view of the healthcare experience. Her insights drawn from overcoming real life challenges fuel her drive to clarify the healthcare system for both patients and caregivers through their writing, through her writing. When not practicing medicine, Dr. Vadat enjoys hiking, aerial acrobatics, and traveling with her family. Dr. Vadat, welcome to the Glenn Alex Show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on with you. Oh, I am so excited to have you because this is a, a unique topic for the Glenn Alex Show. And I, I think it's important for people to understand how to navigate through hospital and medical care. So thank you. Thank so you for having me. Welcome. Let's start with what led you to uh, addressing hospital errors. I would say a good part of my life, um, even before becoming a physician, uh, was playing the part of uh, the caregiver role. Um, I I write about my a lot of my family's health concerns and my personal health issues uh, quite a bit in the book and other social media settings. But I would say um, the bulk of what I speak on is my father's journey. Uh, and he had extensive heart disease and many heart attacks from the time I was a young child. Um, so I remember back in college when, you know, he came to live with me briefly. And even, you know, I was what, probably like 18, 19, I was taking him to the emergency room because he was separated from my mom and and I was kind of playing like, you know, the role of the caregiver. And so it was pretty, those were pretty frightening times. Um, as I kind of got older and went into medicine and, and trained in internal medicine and then um, decided to have a career in hospital medicine, my advocacy for him and others and family and friends and myself continued and I became a little bit more vocal and assertive. <laughs> advocating for for all my loved ones and really what led to sort of me writing about it and doing the the most recent TED talk is just how challenging I found navigating healthcare to be and he spent my dad spent a good part of the last 3 years in and out of the 
out of hospitals. And I saw that as he was getting older, more complex, it really became tough. And if, if I was not paying attention, advocating, speaking up, lots of things could have gone wrong. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, I, I imagine that your family is very fortunate to have you. Uh, I think <laughs> for the most part, I come in handy <laughs> when it comes to uh, medical advocacy. Okay. Okay. Well, in your experience as a caregiver and even as a physician, <laughs> tell us what counts as a hospital or medical error. yeah, I think uh, the challenge is getting good data on, you know, the, the frequency of medical errors, whether hospital or in and outpatient settings. But essentially, medical errors are just, just like it sounds, errors and mistakes that are made when providing health care to patients. And these uh, can lead to harm uh, and sometimes death. Um, so, you know, there's, again, I think there's a lot of underreporting of these mistakes and errors. They fall into different categories. But Um, a study way back in 1999 quoted or, or estimated medical errors uh, in the hospital to, to occur in about 50 to 100,000 cases, just, you know, in the mid, like 2015, 2016, around there, that number had changed and was up to maybe about 250,000 deaths, uh, annually, uh, in the U S. Um, and, A study a couple of years after that, um, you know, thought, quoted that the harm, so death is one variable, but the harm coming from medical errors are, are quite a bit more significant. Um, you know, med medication errors can be, you know, in the millions. So, so we don't really know exact numbers, but um, I think they're quite a bit under underreported. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's break it down for a little bit. Um, what are, are the categories of medical errors? Yeah, because um, the focus of much of my writing is navigating a hospital stay, I'll, I'll kind of mention things that may be more, uh, may be more of, a, of a variable in a hospital stay. Medication Okay. errors are pretty, pretty big. They're kind of top of the list. Uh, we think that when there are medical errors made in the hospital, maybe about 30 to 40 percent come from medication errors. Wow. Um, It's, which is which is quite striking. And that's sort of things like wrong medication being given, the wrong dosage given to the wrong patient, <laughs> or not giving the medicine that the patient's supposed to get. So um, these are pretty, this is a big category. And we think, again, I think the estimates, we'll have to take it with a grain of salt, but affect uh, 1.5 million people are harmed just because of these medication errors. Wow, that's a lot. That's And then, a lot. I'm, I'm sorry, um, some other ones in the hospital that may be relevant are surgical errors, hospital-acquired infections, things that come from care like uh, bed sores or falls. So those are a little bit more common and unique to the hospital setting. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so what... Policies or procedures are in place to minimize, uh, we could just focus on the medication errors because that seems to be the biggest one. What, what policies and procedures are in place in hospitals to minimize that? Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of training on the training for the staff to minimize these errors. As a physician, for example, um, whether in the hospital or outside, a lot of times you have automatic generated messages when you're putting in certain medication. Um, that helps with some of the errors, not all of them. Uh, but for example, if there's medication to medication interaction, sometimes you get a pop-up that, you know, like an automatic sort of message saying, hey, you know, watch out, this patient is also on this medication. Or um, so sometimes, you know, the alarm systems <laughs> uh, notify the staff to 
to pay attention and make sure things are put in accurately, whether it's a, it's a dose that's put in wrong. Um, a lot of times I think what I've heard, uh, you know, in, in, in the news and in studies is that a lot of times we get kind of immune to all of these automatically generated messages and kind of like click them off <laughs> just, <Yeah. laughs> just to be able to get through our work day. Um, yeah. I think a lot of, uh, you know, getting a good history and the patient playing an active role in kind of being aware of, of what's being given to them, what medication that they come in with, what is the proper dose, asking what the staff is giving to them. I think this is really an important role that that patients can play. Um, obviously, it's not always possible if, if the patient is not alert or confused. Right. But, um, and again, um, you know, sometimes in some settings that I work in, staff double checks with other staff to make sure, hey, is this the right medication? So there's, you know, multiple layers of of double checking to make sure things are accurate and given in the right way. That's among physicians, though. And most of <laughs> and in my experience, the physician doesn't actually administer the medication. So what kind of policies and procedures are in place for the nursing staff that actually, you know, draws the medication and um, injects it, for example? Uh, I'm, I'm obviously less familiar with the checks and balances on the nursing end of things, but I know, for example, um, you know, I work in the urgent care uh, and sometimes depending on if I'm working, if the other staff are is a medical assistant or, or nursing, um, that's actually helping with getting the medication out of, you know, the storage. Sometimes they, because again, a nurse has, has different abilities and different administration um, capability than a medical assistant. So when there's a lower trained person, then sometimes they are double checking, hey, you ordered this. Can you please come and look at the name of the medication on the bottle? Within, you know, within nursing, I'm not sure sort of all, all of the training that they go through, but I know that, uh, again, sort of in, in the urgent care setting, they're asking me all the time, is this the right dose? Can you double check? And okay. so. Um, okay. Okay. So the other staff can actually check with the doctor to make sure it's the proper medication and proper dosage. Yeah, I've seen that in the urgent care, I think, because the, the like I said, the the people sometimes that are working, the staff is is not able to do as much and they do need to double check. In the hospital, I've never had a nurse check, <laughs> you know, oh, you. I mean, at least not in settings that I worked in. Just a little footnote or caveat is I have, for the most part, worked as an attending in a university-based medical center. So I'm not the first person also getting calls okay. about medication. There's okay. various levels of, of medical residents, students who are getting called. That, that kind of stuff would never come to my attention. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, if medication is the biggest error in hospitals, what, where do um, misdiagnoses fit? Misdiagnosed? You mean diagnosed, like not diagnosing the correct condition? Yes. Yeah. This is a pretty big um, category, and I'm glad you mentioned that. It's, I don't, I actually cannot find specific statistics on how often this occurs in the hospital, but looking at all of sort of medical cases, outpatient and inpatient, it's it's quite a large part. And I and the quota is maybe up to 15%. Um, it, it can cause harm in 10 to 15% of medical cases. And mm -hmm. so I think the diagnostic errors probably may be occurring a little bit more in the outpatient setting, but uh, we think up to 100,000 de deaths occur because of this. And this is just uh, you know a misdiagnosis, a delayed diagnosis, uh, in inability to diagnose, you know, the correct condition. So th this is huge. That's pretty scary. It is, it is pretty scary. And it's something that uh, I am very sort of, I speak on quite a bit, the, the need for second opinions. I even, uh, you know, I even jokingly say sometimes you may even need a third good opinion. Uh, but I think in certain cases, 
it's very person dependent and situation dependent. So I think if you're younger and you have simple, straightforward medical conditions, maybe it's not as concerning. You have a cold, you have a sore throat, you have an ear infection, you have asthma. You know, these are things that are fairly straightforward and may not have a lot of complications. But I think once you get to more complex cases um, where if we're talking about cancer or, or, or difficult to diagnose conditions, um, I think it's really, really important. And it could be the difference of really life and death to get the correct diagnosis. So I'm a big advocate on getting second opinions um, from providers who specialize in the condition that, you know, you're suffering from. Okay. Okay. I did see in your TED talk that you recommend patients do their own research and get a second and or third opinion um, for the more serious conditions, which I totally endorse. Yeah. And I think one of the things, you know, of course, uh, for the most part, I've practiced in Los Angeles and big cities. I was thinking of all the different places that I've practiced medicine. Um, you know, it's always been in, you know, cities with, with lots of access to multiple facilities that provide excellent care. But I think this issue maybe even should be highlighted for people who live in rural America or smaller towns, because there's not going to be the level of specialists and even physicians practicing in in those you know smaller towns or or, or remote areas. Okay. And I think especially if you or a loved one lives you know out in the middle of nowhere, you have to understand that you may not have have access to the 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 a specialist who's highly trained in that particular condition. So you know you may get the local the opinion of your local doctor. But if things are unclear, you're becoming more complex, things are becoming, you know, challenging, or you can't get to the bottom of things, then you may need to sort of seek care a little bit outside of that area. And, and this is important because I can't emphasize the importance of getting the right diagnosis, because other, if you don't have that, getting the right treatment is going to be pretty darn difficult. And can be harmful if you're getting the wrong treatment. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. And um I can't, you know, if if we went in through the, the number of misdiagnoses in my own family, which is not very large, it would be pretty, you'd be pretty shocked at the number of things <laughs> that have happened. So the diagnosis of the wrong cancer, the a missed, you know, a, a cancer that was never communicated, right. <laughs> uh, telling us there was cancer when there was no cancer, yet at all permutations of strange, you know, medical errors have happened. Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, what you did about the rural areas because access to good health care is important for everyone. And obviously it's going to be more limited in the smaller places. So um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. And hopefully anyone who's in a rural area will keep that in mind if they or someone they love gets diagnosed with something serious or complex. And, and also even in the cities, I think the underserved community um, really needs to be on alert because, um, you know, in certain settings that I work in, uh, patients don't have the greatest insurance, uh, that their care is very spotty, shall we say, they really have a hard time, e even in this is I'm talking about in big cities in LA. Um, they have really hard time getting to their primary care or a primary care that knows them well that sees them consistently. So they may be presenting to the clinic too late, <laughs> when they're too sick. And every time they're seeing different providers, and this is, all creates a lot of potential for errors and things to get missed um, in, in the underserved community, in the homeless community, uh, you know, a lot of times the emergency room becomes the place where they're getting their care because access is so challenging. Right, right. That's a, that is a great point. And you also um, brought up something for me about continuity of care. If if someone is is having a difficult time getting 
seen regularly by, for example, primary care, what suggestions do you have for them? You know, if they go to primary care, then end up in the ER months later about continuity of care. Uh, yeah, I can't, again, sort of one of the things that I'm speak on quite a bit is how important uh, a prim primary care provider is. Um, nowadays with, uh, you know, a lot of physician burnout and people not going into primary care as much, the access I think is going to continue to be challenging. Uh, one of the things I also care about quite a bit is for patients to know who the provider is and what their training is. A lot of times, especially in rural America and smaller towns, even in bigger towns now, um, you may not be able to see an MD as your primary care physician. Right. So mid-level providers such as um, nurse practitioners or physician assistants may be you know, a, a bigger workforce in, in providing primary care services, which is fine. And I and I appreciate my colleagues and I work with you know nurse practitioners and, and physician assistants, but I just think that the patient needs to know who they're seeing, <laughs> hopefully connect to a provider who knows them well and who can advocate for them. So if you want to avoid going to the hospital, the person who can help you make that decision the best is someone who knows you well. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Now, also um, in your TED Talk, um, you talk about advocacy. Give us an example of how you advocated for your father. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Each time. <laughs> I would say uh, probably the, the case where I discuss in the TED Talk uh, was one of the the most stressful periods of time and and uh for your listeners who probably have not heard the TED talk uh basically what happened is that um my father uh had blood in the urine saw a urologist i was not with him what? when he went to see the urologist um he was in a university based you know academic center which was highly respected <laughs> and the urology department is one of the best departments in this center and he went the doctor who was somewhat elderly he was a, he was an older surgeon who'd been around for for a long time was convinced that he had uh cancer and that he needed to have surgery right away um I got involved when the surgery date had already been set. And when I went to the appointment, it was clear that the surgeon really didn't know a whole lot about my father's pretty serious conditions, his heart disease, how he he was a bleeding risk, how he had advanced heart failure. And he didn't seem very knowledgeable about, you know, his risks and, and just making sure that all would go well before going to surgery. So I decided sort of at the last minute to switch surgeons. Um, but there was a lot of uh, negative, basically my father thought he was going to die. And so for, for a period of, I don't, I don't remember now, maybe like a couple of months, um, you know, everything about his mental health, every, every, the way that he just planned things and made decisions was affected by the fact that this doctor had said he was going to have cancer and his prognosis was bad. It ended up that the doctor, the surgeon was wrong. Um, he didn't actually have cancer. And I was so happy that um, we actually kind of investigated and, and changed gears mm -hmm. and found an excellent doctor after some research. So okay. uh, that, that made a huge difference and really, um, was one of the stories. I, I have many, many advocacy stories, but that was one that stands out. Okay. And, and that makes me think of when you're, as a patient and you're seeing a new doctor provider, they don't really know you well. You may not have medical records from, you know, previous medical care, yet it it is still important to ask questions. Yes? Yes, you're talking about for, um, for the patient asking the the physician. patient asking the doctor questions about what is this diagnosis? Are there alternatives? 
what are the other options, et cetera. Because I know a lot of, I, I worked in dialysis for over 20 years, and I know a lot of patients will just do what the doctor says and not even be able to repeat to you what the doctor said or why they prescribed a certain treatment over another one. Yeah, I think that, uh, for lack of a better way of saying this, I mean, you get out of it what you put into it. And if you're not part, if the idea isn't partnering with your provider, physician, whoever it is, you really uh, kind of miss out and, and may fall victim to the things that can go wrong. And if, you know, not everyone has the health literacy <laughs> or even the comfort with, you know, language. Uh, in my father's case, he couldn't even, his English was not the greatest. So just communicating was difficult. Um, you know, if, you, if you're older and have cognitive issues that, that you're gonna be, you know, compromised in terms of how to ask questions. So I think as much as possible, when patients can educate themselves about their records, their labs, having access to that, being knowledgeable, me medications, dosages, having all of that accessible, it really, you make the li your life and the life of the doctor <laughs> uh, a lot easier because then you can be efficient and effective. And so that's what I mean by partnering. Um, but in cases that, you know, you cannot advocate for yourself, you really should be at least trying to plan for having people advocate for you. Now, in the hospital, there's, you know, advocates that work in the hospital setting. Some insurance companies have advocates. As you can imagine, they're a little bit biased in terms of who their employer is. So mm -hmm. uh, independent advocates are working just for you without, you know, any obligation to the hospital or the insurance. So if you can, be knowledgeable and advocate for yourself. If not, get a friend, get a, uh, you know, um, sibling, a, a family member, or a professional advocate, so that you can get the best care. Right. And if, if not, if you don't have that, then there's always that advocate in the hospital. Who, there is who can help bridge the communication gap, so to speak. Definitely. And I, and I talk about, um, in one of the chapters, I don't know which one it is off the top of my head. Now I talk about you do your best to communicate and advocate, <laughs> but that there's sometimes things are not going your way or, or there's challenges. And I actually give a list in the, in the book of, you know, all the, all the strategies and that you can use to get better care or to clarify a situation in the hospital. For example, you can ask for family meetings and sometimes what we do is have the different, it is difficult, but sometimes get all the specialists and the different doctors to meet with the family. So this is a great time because as you probably know, doctors aren't always great at communicating with each other. <laughs> so getting them all in a room with family is really helpful. And you can request that as a patient or a family member. Yeah. Um, Yes, contacting the patient navigator or advocate in the hospital. Yes, they, you know, are working for the hospital, but it's still at least you will have another set of eyes. Somebody will be helping you. Um, so, sir, the, they're definitely the ethics team. There's lots of things you can do. And worst case scenario, which is actually what I did in the hospital with my dad, is I worked on transferring him to a different hospitals. So in the most severe cases where you're really um, not getting the care that you need and you feel that you would be served better elsewhere, then you could start that even though it's a little bit complex. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I'm a proponent of advocacy and self-advocacy and probably have copies of every medical record I've, that, that was created for me in the last 20 years. And when I saw a new primary care doctor, oh, well, two years ago, he just like fell in love with me because I brought him like a, a five-year history of labs and notes from other providers. So whenever you can keep your own records and have them with you when you go see someone new, um, because that will help them learn who you are and, and how to better treat you. So it's a lot. I, I, 
Yeah, I I think this is a great point. And doctors do love, <laughs> you know, a patient that's prepared and organized. And, uh, you know, I talk about this and I've had patients bring me 300, 400 pages of medical records. I talk about consolidating <laughs> it and really making it brief and easy to access. But thanks to AI and new platforms and software that's out now, I was actually at a patient advocate summit recently, and I was blown away by some new companies. Uh, Primary Records, I think, is one of the companies that I met that really make this so simple for for patients. So rather than, you know, the eight portals that you need to log into because right. you're in another state and then in the same town, you went to three different specialists. Okay. There are platforms that um, like uh, primary primary records that you can put in all your login for the different portals and then share it with whoever you want, whether it's family or providers. And then you can ask AI, so you dump all this information in there and you can ask AI, what was my last hemoglobin A1C or what was my last hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. And it gives it to you instantaneously, which is, I think, can you imagine how how amazing that would be when you end up in the ER or the urgent yes. care <laughs> or yes. with the new primary? Okay, so, wow, that's, that's good to know. Helps. Yeah. I, I will look into that because I have a few portals booked <laughs> into. Don't we all? <laughs> okay. Well, tell us a little bit. Um, well, how can someone get your book? What's the title of it and how can they order your book? So the book, I will do a little show and tell here. Okay. <laughs> the Roadmap to Hospital Care, uh, the subtitles, Insights, oh. Preparing for Health Emergencies and Hospital Stays with Confidence is uh, now available on Amazon. Uh, it is a... Uh, I think mere 99 cents online <laughs> with Kindle or whatever those. Uh, so, so the digital uh, version is quite inexpensive. And I hope that um, again, a lot of it is, is things to do and prepare for before a crisis hits. I can't tell you how many times as a hospitalist, I see people without advanced directives. It's about two thirds of people mm -hmm. that have not thought about you know, what they would want, who would, who their health advocate or health proxy is, they have not thought about this. <laughs> and when you're in the middle of a crisis, it's not the right time to be thinking about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it takes the pressure off the family oh. when you are in a crisis. Huge. Yeah. And I talk about the challenges of not thinking about these things in advance as it did in the case of my father. Not that I didn't try to have him tell me what he wanted. But again, culturally, it's not easy in some cultures to have these conversations. I couldn't say, hey, dad, what do you want me to do? Should I feed you? <laughs> do you want to be, you know, on tube feeds? Like this would be very inappropriate. And I tried, but he never, he never shared that information, which became very, very challenging in that last week of life because we didn't know what his wishes were. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, in your TED talk, um, your tips for advocacy pre-crisis was really, uh, were really interesting to me uh, because they weren't necessarily medical. I like when you said, limit your your exposure to negative news, live in gratitude, develop some mind-body skills. How did you come up with those um, to, for self-advocacy and self-care? Because I mean, that's that's my work with, with my clients. So I'm just really interested in, in you saying that. I think, like I said, I mean, from the time I was very young, um, sort of being thrown into medical crises and going to the doctor, going to the emergency room were so commonplace for me that I think I developed a pretty strong PTSD from from just a lot of anxiety, just dealing with with doctors. And I mean, it's funny saying that being a doctor myself, but especially sort of as things, and my father was just one family member, but as things kind of got more serious, more life and death, it's just, you know, I, I realized how, uh, how it can be 
frightening, how it can be scary, how it can really completely <laughs> turn your life upside down to deal with what the health system. And so enough misdiagnoses and errors and problems and, you know, lack of communication, enough things went wrong. And then later we found out it wasn't quite the way, you know, that it was made out to be so that I, in the TED talk, I make a big focus on don't freak out when you get that bad diagnosis. Make sure it's the correct diagnosis. Doctors are busy. They're human. They make errors. I think post-pandemic, with a lot of challenges, I think the risk of errors will go up. I mean, that's sort of what I personally feel. And so people will say things. People will diagnose you with things. <laughs> people will give you a prognosis. And you just need to, like, take a deep breath <laughs> and say, thank you, you are not God. I'm gonna think about what you said. And if it's one of those serious conditions like cancer, let me get another opinion. Yes. Um, and just kind of try to be as centered going through the process because it's not easy and it can really throw you for some curves. Absolutely, absolutely. Now with all of the experience and wisdom you have about hospital errors and advocacy, what is the one takeaway you want the audience to have? One takeaway. <laughs> You're going to make it tough on me. <laughs> I think you just, I mean, I think this is difficult. It's These are not easy topics. Nobody wants to talk about a hospital or medical emergencies. But the more you do your homework and educate yourself about your health condition, your medical issues and you stay engaged the best and just getting your records in order the the more you can be prepared <laughs> in advance the better things are going to go and if you're communicating your wishes to your loved ones to your doctors reassessing periodically that is the best case scenario and as i mentioned if not then having a an, another advocate with you who can speak for you help you and make life a little bit easier because navigating is, the healthcare system is, is overwhelming. It can be, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And thank you so much for making time uh, to be here with us today. I know you are incredibly busy, so I'm very honored that you made time to be here with us. So I'm glad you. it all worked out. I really appreciate uh, our conversation and, and your time as well. well. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Glenn Alex Show. We really hope you learned about hospital and medical errors and advocacy so you can be as healthy as possible. Please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you. Be a precious spirit. With a nourishing thought. Please allow me to leave you with this nourishing thought. Maya Angelou said, I learned a long time ago, the wisest thing I can do is be on my own side. Be an advocate for myself, others like me. Self-advocacy, quite simply, is speaking up for yourself to get your needs met. Those needs can include nourishment, sleep, help with the children or in the home, positive regard, respect, effective medical care, and self-care. Unmet needs lead to depression, anxiety, illness, addiction, and other unhealthy conditions. So advocating for yourself is required for your authentic experience of love and joy and for your total health. Not comfortable speaking up for yourself? Allow others to direct your life and experience? If you answered yes, then those are emotional boundary issues, which are sacrificing your needs to please others and going against your better judgment to give in. You can learn to self-advocate. However, here are a few quick steps. Number one, acknowledge your needs and list them. Two, determine to whom and when to communicate your needs. 
that might be your spouse, your partner, your siblings, your doctor. Vocalize your needs. Communicate, speak with your words what your needs are to the people you think are important to share that with. And then organize your time, energy, and resources to give you space to get what you need. These simple steps can enhance your total health by getting your needs met appropriately, which will enable you to be whole and to live fully, to be wealthy. To learn more about self-advocacy, emotional boundaries, and your health, visit glennalex.com and order your copy of my three-time award-winning book, Living in Total Health. Read my health blogs, then request your complimentary consultation with me so you can start living in total health. Then tune in to the next episode of The Glenn Alex Show. And until next time, be well. Thank you.